All right, it's good to have everybody with us here tonight. We've been going over sound doctrine found in Paul's epistles. Uh, the first eight chapters of Romans is basically foundational doctrine that everybody needs to know. You learn in the first three chapters, you're a sinner, and there's no way that you can save yourself. You learn that we're justified by faith alone. And then in Romans 4 and 5, you learn that you are eternally secure. So not only does Christ save you from your past sins, He also saves you from your future sins. And then Romans 6 through 8, we learn about our identity. We're dead to sin and alive unto Christ. That we should not uh, work, operate in our flesh anymore, but we should let Christ live in us through the sound doctrine that we learn in Paul's epistles. When we do that, we walk in the Spirit. We don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so now in Romans 9 through 11, what Paul does here is explains dispensationalism, basically. Um, because what, we'll, what we say is right dividers is that God started Israel's program, Genesis chapter 12, with Abraham. He made the nation of Israel to have favor nation status above the Gentiles. He gave Israel their own law. We were talking about that last night in our Monday night study. And uh, so he gave him his law, made him his people, and then, but Israel remained in unbelief throughout their entire history. So then at the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, the Lord Jesus Christ sets aside Israel temporarily, and he starts the dispensation of grace with Paul in Acts chapter 9, and that's where we live. And then once the rapture of the body of Christ takes place, then God will resume Israel's program. And when you explain that, that's basic right division in what, a minute, minute and a half. When you explain that to people who have been in fundamental Christianity, um, a lot of times you get objections. that Like, well, you're just making it so complicated. You know, you're not, you know, it's not that complicated. There's only one gospel. There's only one plan. Why are you making it so complicated? Uh, well, the thing is, it's not really what we're doing, number one, is we're just believing God and His Word. I mean, I'm not, I'm not making this stuff up. You know, everything I mentioned, I've got verses to support that scriptural backing for all of that. But what we're going to learn in Romans 9 through 11 is the reason God has to do it this way is this is the only way man would believe and be saved. Um, this, the, the fact that right division is true and how it's explained in Romans 9 through 11 should be the greatest argument against Calvinism. You know, it's interesting that you'll read at the end of Romans 8 where it talks about how in verse 29, or Romans 8, 28, you're called, verse 29, God foreknew, you're predestinated, uh, verse 30, you're predestinated, you're called, you're justified, you're glorified, and Calvinists may use verses like that to try to show that uh, God forces some people into heaven and forces others into hell, and there's nothing you can do about it. But if that were the case, um, we would not be here it would not have taken 6,000 years from Adam to get to this point. Here we are 6,000 years after Adam's original sin, and the heavens are still unclean in God's sight, and the earth, of course we know that. Satan is the God of this world. The earth isn't reconciled back to God either. If God, if Calvinism was true, then God would have wrapped this all up a whole lot, a long time ago. But what God had to do is he had to come up with a plan by which uh, we would use our free will to make the decisions to believe God in His Word, to believe the Gospel, to be saved, so that God could reconcile heaven back to Himself and also earth back to Himself. And that plan is explained for us in Romans 9 through 11. And you can sort of think of Romans and what's going on here is you can know, you know that the flesh, you know, Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us, the heart, which there is talking about the flesh, is deceitful. Your flesh is desperately wicked. Your flesh is wicked and it's deceitful above all things. So every time that Paul introduces a truth in Scripture, your flesh is there to try to come up with an argument against it. So like in chapter 1, we know that we're sinners 
But what, what man says in Romans 1 is, uh, Romans 1, your flesh says, um, there is no God. That's what your flesh says. Maybe I should have headlined all this. This is talking about what your flesh, what your flesh does. There is no God. So then you're proved in Romans 1, you're proved, well, there is a God. Uh, you know from creation, you know from your internal witness of the conscience that there is a God and that you're worthy of death as a result. So then the flesh says, okay, okay, now that you prove there is a God, well, uh, Romans 2, your flesh says, uh, I can please God. And that's where religion comes in. I can please God. And then Romans 3, you find out, well, no, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You can only be justified by faith. So then your flesh comes in and says, okay, well, okay, I can't. You've proved there is a God. You've proved I can't please God. So now uh, I have to be justified by faith. But now I will, uh, I will go ahead and uh, serve God now that I'm saved. Now that I, yeah, before I couldn't please God, but now that I'm saved, I can please God. So your flesh says, um, not, your flesh says, now that I am saved, I can please God. And so God's response to the flesh is Romans 4 through 5, it's eternal security. It is, well, no, you can't, because still in your flesh dwells no good thing, so we've got to, you've got to be eternally secure so that now you can serve God. And so then, Romans 6, you learn you're dead to sin and alive unto Christ, and again, your flesh says, your flesh is going to say, well, I can serve God myself. So the flesh again tries to serve God. And by the time you get to Romans 8, you find out, well, no, uh, the only way to serve God is to walk in the Spirit. Because I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law warring in my members and bringing me to captivity to the law of sin and death. So the only way I can operate by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus is if I walk in the Spirit, my flesh can't serve God. So what Paul is doing, and this is your foundational doctrine, if you know Romans 1 through 8, you've got basic foundational doctrine that over 99% of churchianity doesn't know. Um, and these are all attacks by the flesh. Romans 1, there is no God. Romans 2, okay, now that you've proved that, but I can please God. And then, oh, okay, well, I, well now that I'm saved, I can please God. Oh, eternal security, I can't. Well, I'll try to serve God. No, that doesn't work either. So you got all these objections by the flesh because your flesh is desperately wicked. So it tries at every turn when God does something to help you, get you saved, get sound doctrine, come into the knowledge of the truth, eternal security, your flesh is there to basically say, oh, I can do that. I don't need God. I can do that. And it tries to get the upper hand. And so now that you got all this foundational doctrine from Romans 1 through 8, uh, what God has done is he's answered basically every argument that your flesh has had. And now the final argument, at least in Romans here, is the flesh says, Romans 9 through 11, the flesh says, okay, I learned that there is a God, that I can't please him, that... Uh, it took Christ's blood to save me, and I'm eternally secure, and I can't serve God, but let, so now I walk in the Spirit, I do all these things, but now your, your flesh's objection is, um, your flesh says, and this, again, this is what your flesh says, your flesh says God is not faithful. That's what your flesh says, I'll, I'll make sure I put that, flesh says that. I don't want you to think I'm saying God is not faithful. Your flesh says that because what it does is it says, well, I've read about Israel and all these promises that God made to Israel, that God would make them a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles. He would give them eternal life on earth. Jesus Christ would set up God's kingdom on earth. And now I don't see any of that. So since 
that didn't happen, then okay, even though you've answered all of my objections, the flesh says, in these first eight chapters of the book of Romans, um, why would I die daily to the flesh? Why would I serve God? Why would I do these things because, what, God's promised that I will have a reward in heavenly places? But God promised rewards to Israel. He said that the 12 apostles, they'll sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. I don't see that. God promised Jesus would sit on the throne. David would sit on the throne as a co-regent with Jesus in God's kingdom on earth. I don't see that. Uh, God says he's going to rule here. I don't see that happening. God says he's going to divide the world into different nations and they're, and they're all going to come under the authority of Jerusalem. Um, basically, the flesh says, I don't see all that. So, so big deal that I learn all this doctrine in Romans 1 through 8. If I don't see the fruit of the doctrine from Israel's program... I don't see that, then why would I, in other words, why would I believe this stuff? Okay, I understand there is a God that I can't please God, that Jesus died for my sins, that I have eternal security, and I can't serve God in my flesh, but why would I want to serve God if he's not going to come through with the promises that he gave me? That he's going to give me eternal life in heavenly places? That he's going to give me a throne, a principality, a power, might, or dominion in heavenly places? Why would I buy into this? Why would I forsake the course of this world and suffer persecution from my flesh, from the world, from churchianity, from all these people. Why would I let that happen if I'm not sure I'm going to get heaven and I'm not going to get a place in heavenly places because I don't see the fruit. I don't see God fulfilling his promises to Israel. So why would I think he would fulfill them to me? So that's why Romans 9 through 11 now, you're going to have God through our apostle Paul explaining dispensationalism. And the, the answer to the flesh is, it's not that God was not faithful to his promise. It's that Israel didn't believe. That's the problem. And God knew this would happen all along. And so this really all fall, because the thing about God, while he's not forcing Israel to be in unbelief, He's not forcing Israel to crucify their Messiah. He didn't force them to do all these things um, because they had the free will. At the same time, God has foreknowledge of what man's free will decisions would be. So God, when he, before he made heaven and earth, he came up with a plan by which he could make man and then man would use his free will decisions to accept God's love God's love will be commended to man in that Christ died for their sins. And so then that way, those who believe the gospel that God gives them, which wherever they live, whatever that promise is, they believe that gospel, then they'll have eternal life and they'll, be, they'll receive God's love and they'll give God's love out to others in eternity. And because God's love came to them through Jesus Christ, then God gets glory by sharing his love to everybody and he brings glory to his son and that his son made that possible for man to share God's love through others and bring God glory. And God came up with that plan knowing full well exactly what man's free will decisions would be. Because people ask, you know, when you get the right division, that's a one common thing, we'll say, well, because Israel rejected their Messiah, and then after the Holy Ghost ministry in the first part of Acts, then they rejected uh, the ministry of the little flock. And so God sets aside Israel. He starts the dispensation of grace. And now he's reconciling heavenly places back to himself. And one of the great objections is, well, what if Israel didn't crucify their Messiah? What if they accepted him by faith? Then God would set up his kingdom on earth but then the heavens aren't clean in God's sight. He would never start the dispensation of grace. And the answer to that is, if Israel would have accepted, of course God knows in his foreknowledge what they would do, if they would have accepted his plan, uh, their, their Messiah by faith, then God would have had a different plan. He would have done things differently. 
Uh, certainly Israel would have got those promises, but he would have had to have done something differently to reconcile heavenly places. Maybe start that first. I don't know. Uh, but God in his foreknowledge, when he made heaven and earth, knew what man would do, that Adam would sin, that Israel would reject him, that, the, that God would start the dispensation of grace with Paul. He knew all this stuff. And he used his foreknowledge of man's free will decisions to come up with a plan by which he can reconcile both heaven and earth back to himself through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that plan is what we see here. And it's going to be explained here in Romans 9 through 11. For example, I'll just cut to the chase and we'll, re we'll look at the summary here at the end of Romans 11. On the handout, um, I came up with basically nine sections and we'll go over this in detail because it's very important that we understand these things. There's a lot of bad doctrine that comes from not, not only not rightly dividing the word of truth, but also from misapplying things in Romans 9 through 11. Paul says, consider what I say, the Lord give thee understanding in all things. you got a lot of people who don't rightly divide the word of truth who will take these three chapters which explain dispensationalism and they'll twist them around to fit their uh, mode of thinking. For example, they'll say, well, we're spiritual Israel today. The promises that God gave to Israel are given to us. And they'll use Romans 11 and the olive tree to explain that. Uh, or they'll say, well, you know, you gotta, you got to confess your sins uh, in order to be saved, and they'll use Romans 10 to tell you that. So they'll take doctrine out of Romans 9 through 11, which is meant to explain dispensationalism, to answer the flesh's objection that says, the flesh says, God is not faithful, therefore I should not apply Romans 1 through 8. Romans 9 through 11 is going to say, God knew what would happen all along. This is according to plan, and he's going to go through and explain all that. And when, so we need to go through this in detail so that it answers some of these objections that churchianity has as they twist these things to fit their agenda. Uh, so let's just go right to the end in Romans 11, and you can see what God's plan is. Why did he do this? Why did he start Israel? Then he sets them aside. And then he starts the dispensation of grace of Paul. And then we get raptured up. And then Israel, he goes back to Israel's program, and they get saved. People say, that's too complicated. Well, the reason is because of man's free will to choose not to believe God is, is why he did that. So, it says, uh, let's start in verse uh, 30. Look in Romans 11 and verse 30. So, we'll start there. And you just this will just be a summary of why God did it the way he did it. And then we'll go back and start in Romans 9. Here, we're not going to get through all the notes tonight. And that's okay, because I do want to make sure we go through this to where we can answer some objections, some questions, especially if you're a right divider and you're talking to people who are not right dividers, uh, they'll bring up verses from these chapters and they try to make you think that right division is not correct and, you know, go along with their Reformed theology or their confession or whatever they're talking about. And now hopefully you'll have the, the answers to give them. Uh, so Romans 11, 30, he says, For as ye, so that would be the Gentiles, this is today, who he's talking to, ye in times past have not believed God, yet now have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, through Israel's unbelief. Even so have these also now not believe, so Israel has not now believed, that through your mercy, through the mercy given to Gentiles, they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. There is a three-verse explanation. Those three verses, there is a summary of why right division slash dispensationalism, acts, I should say Acts 9 dispensationalism, um, is true. Those three verses there. And basically what he says there, he says in verse 32, God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. So he had to conclude both Gentiles and Jews in unbelief before people would be saved. Is basically what that's saying. 
You know, in other words, man has to learn things the hard way. You think of Israel. You know, God brought Israel out of Egypt, and he says, go into the promised land. I'm giving you the land of Canaan. I brought you out of Egypt. You can see I have the power to do it. Just go into the land. But they didn't believe God. So because of their unbelief, they end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And then when they finally get into the land, the next generation, you never have them fully possessing the land due to their unbelief. Uh, God says, I'll give it to you. But yet, you never see all of Israel saved the easy way. That's the easy way. God does these miracles and he just brings you right in. They got to do things the hard way. The only way Israel is going to be saved is they go through a seven-year tribulation period. Half of the world's population is killed during that time. There are great plagues and disasters that happen. Uh, that's the only way they can learn. So it's just man and our pride and our stubbornness. Um, God loves us. He doesn't want to see any of us suffer. He doesn't want any of us to, you know, have pain and have to go to hell and all these different... But, but it's just man's stubbornness is to the point where man has to be concluded in unbelief before God will have mercy, before they'll accept God's mercy. You know, you can think of it sort of like someone who has an alcoholic problem, and uh, you could see that it's ruining their lives. But they say, ah, oh, I can handle it. I quit whenever I want, you know. It's like they got to hit their rock bottom, whether it's losing their spouse or losing their job or their kids or all three. They've got to go through all that before they'll say, yeah, I really do need help. You know, it's like there's this pride in them to say, eh, I just do it for fun or whatever. And, but they got, but they got to hit that rock bottom before they'll actually accept help. They won't do it when it's easy. When you say, oh, you, don't you think you should, you know, try to, uh, you know, I see some signs in you, shouldn't you try to quit alcohol? They won't do it then, before they lose their spouse, before they lose their kids, before they lose their job. They got to lose all those things first. So you can think of man sort of like that, the pride that man has to say, ah, I don't need God, I'm fine on my own. And so man has to basically hit rock bottom. So he says there in Romans 11:32, God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. So in Genesis chapter 10, I'm sorry, 11, Genesis 11, Tower of Babel, God concludes Gentiles in unbelief. It concludes Gentiles in unbelief. He starts in the nation of Israel, the very next chapter with Abram, Genesis chapter 12. And then from Genesis 12 to Acts 7, Israel has favor nation status. They're God's people. Um, the entire time, of course, there's always a believing remnant, but for the entire time, the vast majority of the Jews are in unbelief. They will not, um, you know, they will not believe God. And so after they have rejected God the Father through beheading John the Baptist, they rejected God the Son by crucifying Jesus, they rejected God the Holy Ghost by stoning Stephen. After they've done all those things, then God says, okay, now in Acts 7, at the stoning of Stephen, then God concludes, God concludes Israel in unbelief. God wanted to save the Gentiles at first, but look at what happened. They all, every thought of man's heart was only evil continually. Sure, there was a guy like Enoch that was saved, maybe a few others, but for the most part, man back there before the flood was in unbelief, and God had to destroy them through, through Noah there in the flood. Then they start back up again after Noah, and they get to the point where they're gonna, they're, the whole world is united in rebellion against God. And so then God says, I've got to give up on the Gentiles. I conclude the Gentiles in unbelief at the Tower of Babel. Then he goes with Israel. Again, Israel, he's trying to save them from the beginning. Brings them out of Egypt through a mighty hand with all the wonderful plagues that he did against Egypt. Uh, Israel didn't have to do any of that stuff. You know, they didn't have to part the Red Sea. They just walked on dry land. God destroyed Pharaoh and his army, or Pharaoh's army there in the, in the, uh, or the Red Sea. And uh, the Jews walked across on dry land. And when they needed help in the wilderness, God brought miracles. But yet, they kept in unbelief that entire time. 
So, uh, and then the whole history of the Old Testament is nothing but 1,500 years of unbelief, and we'll see more of that when we get over in Romans 9. And so then God finally concludes Israel in unbelief at the stoning of Stephen. So it says there in Romans 11.32, God has the foreknowledge that the only way man is going to believe is first, he's got to create some jealousy. He's got to create two groups. He's got to create Jews and Gentiles. Because you see, when he didn't have the two groups, that man just went in unbelief. Noah's day destroys them. Uh, the Tower of Babel day had to divide them into nations. So man is in... Uh, when they're just one group like that, you know, there's no nations, there's no languages. Um, man just unites in his unbelief against God. So God had to create a rivalry, if you want to call it, or some jealousy there between, and we're going to see that in Romans 11, uh, the miracles done through the Gentiles under Paul to provoke Israel to jealousy. So he creates the two groups, the Gentiles and Jews. And right away he concludes the Gentiles in unbelief then, in Acts 7, the stoning of Stephen, he concludes Israel in unbelief. And so then, he knows that Romans 11.32 says, God had to conclude them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. So then, when you get to Acts 9, Acts 9 until the rapture, that's where you see uh, Gentiles, Gentile salvation. That's the mercy, God's mercy, upon the Gentiles. For the first time, a, a good number of Gentiles are actually believing God and being saved. And that started with Paul and the dispensation of grace in Acts 9, and it goes into the rapture. Now you look at that period that's been about 2,000 years, you know, don't know how long it's going to continue, but you notice in that period of time, the vast majority of people who are saved are Gentiles. It's not Jews. But then, once the rapture takes place, from the rapture unto Jesus' second coming, Jesus' second coming, that's where you see, uh, well, for the first time, a large group of Jewish salvation. You see there in Revelation chapter 7, and that's God's mercy on the Jews. You see in Revelation chapter 7 that there are 144,000 Jews that are sealed, saved Jews, halfway through the tribulation period. And then there are going to be more Jews, the rest of the lost sheep of the house of Israel, saved in the last half of the tribulation period. So the reason for right division is because, not because God couldn't come up with a, you know, a simple plan, it was that man was in unbelief. I mean, you think about the from the moment that man sinned in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God brought a curse upon the man and upon the woman and says they're going to die like he had promised. But then he says, uh, Genesis 3.15, I'm going to bring a redeemer through the seed of the woman. And when you read when uh, Eve gives birth to her first son Cain, she says, I've got a man from the Lord. She thinks, oh, seed of the woman, here it is. I'm the woman. I just gave birth to seed, Cain. So Cain's going to be the redeemer. Huh. Cain's not the redeemer. He kills his brother Abel. So, um, <laughs> you know, so God promises a redeemer at the same time that Adam and Eve sin. And yet the redeemer doesn't come for 4,000 years. And yet there isn't redemption for a mass group of people. At least the heavens are not reconciled back to God for at least 2,000 years after Jesus' resurrection, because that happened almost 2,000 years ago, and we haven't had the rapture yet. And then after that, you're going to have Israel saved. So that's what he's saying here in Romans 11, verse 30. For as ye in times past, the Gentiles in time past, did not believe God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. So the Gentiles had to be concluded in unbelief at the Tower of Babel. Then Israel concluded in unbelief at the stoning of Stephen before Gentiles would actually believe God. Just like the alcoholic has to reach rock bottom before he'll accept help, 
or just like Israel wouldn't go into the into the promised land when God gave it to him it's like man's pride is so great that he has to hit that rock bottom spiritually speaking to where God spends 4,000 years of history from Adam to the stoning of Stephen before he can conclude Gentiles in Israel in unbelief before man as a whole hits that rock bottom and now for the first time Gentiles are saved God's mercy so he says there in verse 30 ye the Gentiles in times past have not believed God yet have now obtained mercy through Israel's unbelief even so have these Israel also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy so once the rapture takes place God's mercy to the Gentiles now the Jews will finally believe so the Gentiles won't believe until God concludes both them and Israel in unbelief and Israel won't believe until God shows mercy to the Gentiles and they're raptured up in the body of Christ and heavenly places are reconciled back to God and so that's why right division is true that's why dispensationalism is true uh, you're saying you make it so complicated you know who made it complicated was man man in a stubborn pride and free will who gets chance after chance after chance for 4,000 years back here to believe God from Adam to the stoning of Stephen and you don't have a mass group of people believing God for 4,000 years that's not God's fault it's man's fault God commended his love toward man no matter when you're born you have the chance to have eternal life with God as a free gift to you that God gives it to you and yet for 4,000 years as a whole I mean there are always exceptions you know we have Old Testament Saints but for the most part man rejects God so the reason right division and dispensationalism is true is because of man's pride his stubbornness in rejecting God and finally it takes 4,000 years before we'll actually believe and the Jews won't believe until they see the mercy given to the Gentiles at the rapture which is why he's got to again God can't save us all at once he's got to save the Gentiles first and then the rapture takes place then he saves the Jews and so rather than saying you're making it too complicated when that plan is all seen here what Paul exclaims in Romans 11 33 Romans 11 33 oh the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out for who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor you see it's such a wise plan that if I use my natural mind my fleshly mind to try to figure it out I can't figure it out you have to be a believer and the Holy Ghost has to show this to you if you know I've got the it's clear on the, the words on the page are clear to I think all of us on this zoom call that this is why right division is true this is why God did the things did things the way he did it but if you've got an atheist and reading these same verses they won't get this they won't understand it because it's spiritually discerned the Holy Ghost has to teach it to you because the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God are so great you think of Lucifer Ezekiel 28 says he was the anointed cherub that covered that he was perfect in wisdom and beauty Lucifer is a lot smarter than us that's for sure and yet he didn't figure it out he thought Lucifer uh, he became Satan when he fell Satan thought he won when he had Jesus crucified that was that was Satan's plan God's plan all along was to have Jesus crucified on a cross but he didn't reveal that to Satan and Satan is there and he's, he's and he's using his great wisdom far greater than us and he says I know how I will defeat God's plan I will have Jesus crucified on a cross and what he did is he played right into God's hand so even a creature like Satan who has far greater wisdom than us in our flesh even he couldn't figure it out so if someone approaches Romans 9 through 11 as we explain these and go through these verses and they don't have the attitude of I'm believing God in his word I'm taking my flesh my preconceived notions 
what churchianity has taught me, what secular humanism has taught me. I'm taking all that, setting it aside, and I'm just going to believe God and His Word. If you don't do that, you're not going to get this. You have to trust God and His Word. And it's not that you have to be a genius to figure this out. Because 1 Corinthians 2 tells us that when we read and believe God's Word, it's the Holy Ghost who teaches us the deep things of God. So it's not like only the high IQ genius people can learn right division. No, it's, it's really the people who are dumb enough to set aside their own wisdom and worldly fleshly wisdom and just believe whatever God tells them. Yeah, yeah, somebody like Benoit, he's dumb enough to not listen to his own brain. And still we're going to use the mind of Christ here to learn the things of God. So with that in mind, that's basically a summary of where we are and why Romans 9 through 11 is here. So with that, let's go through, um, the go back to Romans 9, let's go through, we're not going to go through every verse, but uh, basically hit the, the main points as we go through. And again, it's going to take more than one week, but it's important for us to understand these things. Because remember who you're dealing with. Even if you're not dealing with churchianity and other people who are saying, oh, we're spiritual Israel, you know, we're Reformed theologians. Even if you're not dealing with that, you still have your flesh that at first said, there is no God. That later on says, well, now that I know there's God, I can please God. Oh, now that I'm saved, I can please God. My flesh can serve God. And now, you're, now your flesh is saying, well, why should I even apply Romans 1 through 8? God's not going to give me these promises. And so, um, so you're going to have some battles here. That's why 2 Timothy 3, 12 says, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Um, you, depending on when you live and what government you're in, the government may persecute you for believing God and His Word. Maybe they don't. Depending on your environment, the family and friends that you have may or may not persecute you for believing this. But you will suffer persecution guaranteed from your flesh. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. Every day I make the decision, I'm going to read God's Word, I'm going to believe what it says, and I'm not going to let my flesh deceive me into trying to follow its lusts. And instead, I'm going to use the mind of Christ. So with that in mind, Romans 9. You notice in verse 1, he says, Romans 9, 1, he's telling you right off the bat, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. It's important that we understand. That's why I titled this message, God Explains Dispensationalism. And you say, well, this is Paul writing. Yes, it's Paul writing, but because this is Scripture, all, all Scripture is given by the Holy Ghost. Giving So in this case, the Holy Ghost gives Paul the words to write down. And so he wants to make it clear to your flesh. God, the accusation that God is not faithful that God failed in bringing His promises to Israel <coughs> is not true. He says, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost. And we know from 1 Corinthians 14, 37 and from Ephesians 4 that God gave the body of Christ prophets and their job was to take the writings of Paul and by the Holy Ghost telling them this is scripture or this other writing is not scripture. Uh, Paul evidently knew when he was writing Romans, this was the Holy Ghost giving him these words and this was scripture. And you had prophets given to the body of Christ who have confirmed this. So we know that when he's writing this, this isn't Paul in his fleshly mind explaining dispensationalism for us. It's God through the Holy Ghost explaining dispensationalism. So he says... Um, right away, you can tell the idea of Reformed theology that we're spiritual Israel. For those who don't know, there's a, a pretty big um, segment, I guess you could say, or probably majority of fundamental churchianity that has the idea that because Israel crucified their Messiah and they, um, you know, they stoned Stephen and they beheaded John the Baptist and they just continued to reject God, that when, um, when the church started in Acts chapter 2, that that was really all the promises that God made to Israel in the Old Testament now belong to us. And so we now are spiritual Israel. So that's why 
most fundamental churchianity doesn't rightly divide the word of truth. So when they read promises in the Old Testament, they'll apply it to them. So when they read in 2 Chronicles 7.14 that uh, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, seek my face, I will heal their land. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And they automatically apply that to the United States or whatever nation you're in uh, because they're saying, we need to get back to God and then God will heal our land because he promised in 2 Chronicles 7.14. Well, that was Israel. That wasn't us. We, the United States was not given supernaturally by God to us and God is not going to set up his kingdom and his throne on the earth in the United States for all eternity. Contrary to what the Mormons would say where they say he's going to set it up in Independence, Missouri. But yet they're over in Utah now. I don't know how all that worked. But anyway, uh, it's going to be in Jerusalem, in Israel, because the promises are to Israel. And Paul makes that clear here. He says in verse 3, I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Remember, Paul is a Jew, uh, Hebrew of the Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin. So a, a kinsman according to the flesh is going to be Jews. He says in verse 4, who are Israelites? If we're talking, if we are spiritual Israel today, it wouldn't say, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom? To who? Israel according to the flesh. Not spiritual Israel, but to Israel according to the flesh pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. The promises of God in your Old Testament given to Israel, even after the cross, after Paul is called in, in Acts 9, when Paul writes um, when Paul writes Romans, he's around, where is it, around Romans, uh, I'm not, not Romans, uh, Acts, Acts chapter 20. Yeah, he's writing Romans around Acts 20. I mean, it's pretty late uh, as far as after the cross, uh, after the, the rejection of the Holy Ghost in the early part of Acts, Estonian of Stephen, you're, you're quite, quite a few years after all of that. And still after all of that, he says... The promises of God are still belonging to Israel according to the flesh. So those promises, so he says, uh, Israel's promises still belong to Israel. I mean, that, that is clear in Romans 9, 3 and 4. He's made that clear. But yet here's churchianity trying to say, oh, we're spiritual Israel. We get these promises. Now here's Paul saying, after all this rejection that they've done, long after Acts 2, here he is saying the promises that God made to Israel in the flesh still belong to Israel according to the flesh. Verse 5, Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh... Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. So then, again, there's the objection that your flesh has. Your flesh says, well, God's not faithful. God made all these promises, verse 4, the adoption, the glory, the covenants, given the law, service of God, promises, all these things God gave to Israel, and yet they didn't come to pass. So God must not be faithful. So now he's going to address that. He says, verse 6, he says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. So what he does there, and let's, uh, hope you got all this with the flesh, because let's start back up here. What he's doing here in verse 6, You notice from verse, well, let's, let's start back. Verses 3 through 5, he says, Israel's promises 
are to Israel in the flesh. Because he said there, verse 3, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Verse 5, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came. So all these promises that adoption, the glory, the covetous, giving the law, service of God, the promises, they're given to Israel in the flesh. That's showing that middle wall of partition that God says Israel is above the Gentiles. So if you're a Jew, then you get these promises. Jesus said in John 4, 22, Jesus said salvation is of the Jews. If I'm a Gentile back in the Old Testament, I can't just go to God and say, please forgive me of my sins. Uh, that's not going to work. Because Israel is supposed to be the priest between God and the Gentiles. So what I have to do as a Gentile is i got to go to the Jews. That's why over Matthew 15, there was a Syrophoenician woman asking God for a miracle, asking Jesus for a miracle. He wanted to speak to the woman. And it's not that he won't speak to women, because in John 4, he spoke to the Samaritan woman. He's the one who initiated the conversation. But this woman in Matthew 15, the Gentile woman, he won't even speak to her. Finally, he says, well, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The reason I'm not speaking to you is you don't go through the proper channel. You're a Gentile. You're on the wrong side of the middle wall of partition. Salvation is of the Jews. If you went through a Jew first, then I'd talk to you. But you went directly to me. You can't do that. You're a Gentile. Now, of course, he ends up talking to her because the problem is she understood that, but those Jewish religious leaders, the only way they're going to do anything for you is if you grease their palms. And the woman, I don't think she had any money. She couldn't do that. So she couldn't bribe the Jewish religious leaders to go talk to Jesus. So she had to go. She said, well, the only way it's going to work is I go myself. And once Jesus understands that she understood the program, that the Jews were above the Gentiles, then she ends up doing that miracle. He ends up doing the miracle for her. But the point is, so we learn from Romans 9, 3 through 5, that Israel's promises are to Israel in the flesh due to that middle law of partition, due to that favor nation status that Israel had. But then what he's going to do starting in verse 6 is he's going to tell you that although Israel's promises are to Israel in the flesh, what we're now going to learn is Israel only receives the promises. They only receive the promises if they believe God. That's why over there in John 3, there's that term. Nicodemus comes to Jesus. And Jesus says, if a man... Well, you must... <laughs> I'm not going to quote it correctly, so let me go over there. <laughs> let me go over there and read it. Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and Jesus says in John 3, 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This right here, Romans 9, 6, they believe God. This is a reference to them being born again. Jesus says over there in John 3, 3, you must be born again. And then he defines it in verse 5. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So he's saying that the promises are to Israel in the flesh, but they only receive the promises if they believe God. In other words, if they're born again, meaning born of the Spirit, which means they, they believe God, they believe the gospel. In Jesus' day, it was repent and be water baptized then they would be born again and they would receive those promises. So that's the important factor there. And what that tells you then is it answers the objection of the flesh, where the flesh says, well, why should I practice Romans 1 through 8 doctrine and go through suffering and dying daily and suffering persecution and all this stuff? 
and having my family and friends forsake me because they think I'm a lunatic following Romans 1 through 8 and rightly dividing the word of truth. Why should I do that when I'm not going to get the promises? So then your flesh says, give up on that, just live like the world. After all, we already learned we're eternally secure, so why bother with this stuff? And what Paul is doing is he's saying, no, God wasn't unfaithful. It was Israel. God gave the promises to Israel in the flesh, but they're only realized, they're only received if Israel decides to believe God, the gospel that God gives them. Then they are born again or born of the Spirit, and then they receive the promises. But we've got a history of Israel not doing that. So then what he does here, so that's what he means in Romans 9, 6, when he says, they are not all Israel which are of Israel. So when he says, not all, not all Israel, this is a reference to spiritual, which are of Israel, and that's a reference to the flesh. And a great, which we won't go into it, but uh, a great passage to read is Jesus' conversation with the Pharisees in John chapter 8. Because they say, Abraham is our father, we're the seed of Abraham. And Jesus says, I know that you are Abraham's seed, but Abraham's not your father. Because if Abraham was your father, you would not seek to kill me. A man who has done nothing wrong, who's just told you the truth. That's not what Abraham did. So yes, I know you are a physical descendant of Abraham, but that doesn't mean you're going to be in the kingdom. And in fact, spiritually speaking, John 8, 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. So when Paul says in Romans 9, 6, it's not as though the word of God had taken none effect. It's not that God wasn't faithful. What you need to understand is they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Not all Israel of the flesh is part of spiritual Israel or what is called in Galatians 6.16, it's called the Israel of God. So yes, the promises are given to Israel in the flesh. Yes, there is a middle wall of partition. Yes, Israel has favorite nation status. But they don't receive, as he says in Galatians, uh, Romans 9.4, Romans 9.4, they don't receive the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the law, service of God, the promises. They don't receive those things unless they are part of the Israel of God, spiritual Israel, which occurs if they believe God, the gospel God has given them, so that they are born again, meaning born of the Spirit. And so now with that established, he's going to give you an example. He's going to say, um, look at Abraham, verse 7, Romans 9, 7. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So, Romans 9, 7. Isaac gets the promises. Ishmael, no promises. Both Isaac and Ishmael are physical descendants of Abraham. Abraham was the physical father of Isaac and Ishmael. But Isaac gets the promises because Isaac believed God. Ishmael did not. And then you say, well, you know, that's the, but, you know, Abraham had, uh, Sarah was the mother of Isaac, but uh, Hagar was the mother of Ishmael. And so you may say, well, then, then maybe that's the difference. No, okay, let's go to another one here. Uh, verse 10, not only this, so if you don't take this example, let's give you another one, not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So verses 10 through 13. Now we're in Romans 9, 10 through 13. Jacob gets the promises. 
Esau, no promises. And you can't make the excuse and say, well, different mothers, because that's not the case. Because the mother of Jacob and Esau was Rebecca. Rebecca, is that right? Where am I? Yes, Rebecca. Sometimes I get Rebecca and Rachel confused. Uh, so the mother of Jacob and Esau was Rebecca, and the father of Jacob and Esau was Rebecca. The father of Jacob and Esau was Isaac. Now I'm getting Rebecca and Isaac confused. And not only that, so they both had the same father and mother, but they're born at the exact same time. They're twins coming out of the womb at the exact same time. So you can't say that one is a better lineage, you know, like you'd say with Isaac. Well, better lineage because it's Sarah as opposed to the, the servant Hagar. No, the lineage is exactly the same. And you can't say, well, the birth, the time difference, birth was different. Because they're both twins. They're both born at the exact same time. They both have the same father and the same mother. So what's the difference is, well, the difference is Jacob believed God and Esau didn't. So Isaac gets the promises because he's a believer. Ishmael is an unbeliever. Jacob gets the promises because he's a believer. Esau, unbeliever. So what that means, it goes back to the statement of Romans 9, 6. They are not all Israel, which are of Israel. And he's giving you that illustration. You have to be born of the Spirit, born again. You only receive the promises if you believe God. Has nothing, well... I shouldn't say it. it still it has something to do with your your lineage because remember again Romans 9 3 through 5 that Israel's promises are to Israel in the flesh so uh, they had to be Jews or else they're on the wrong side of the middle wall partition doesn't mean they couldn't be saved Rahab is saved you got Gentiles who are saved but to be in that position of the promises and everything that was given to Israel they were given those promises uh, so you had to be of a Jew uh, descendant in the flesh. But you don't get them just because you are a Jew. You get the promises because you are a believer. You have to be a Jew, but then you also have to be a believer. So Isaac gets the promises, not Ishmael. Jacob gets the promises, not Esau. And you can't blame it on the father or the mother or when they're born. As Jacob and Esau are born at the exact same time with the exact same parents. Um, having said that then, so, so then what he does there is he's showing you, he's answering the objection of God not being faithful. Um, it's not on God, it's on man who doesn't believe. So having said that then, uh, before we move on to Moses and Pharaoh, what goes on there, um, we should probably mention a couple of things in these verses because there's the Calvinist, again, rearing his ugly head, trying to tell you that, uh, well, it's because Jacob was loved by God and God hated Esau, and so it shows that God predestinated Jacob to believe and to, to be saved and Esau to uh, go to hell as a result. I mean, after all, you can see there in verse 11, that parenthetical phrase, for the children being not yet born neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. I mean, that right there, it seems like you could just pull that out and it sounds like, well, that's, pre that's got predestination written all over it because uh, they're not even born yet. And God has already told Rebecca and Isaac, the elder is going to serve the younger, that the younger is going to get the blessing that the firstborn usually gets. So automatically you think, okay, well, that's showing you predestination, Calvinism, you know. Um, but what it's, it, that's not what it's showing. Because remember, the reason why Paul is talking about Romans 9 through 11, the accusation of the flesh is that God is not faithful to his promises, to fulfill his promises. He's not here to talk about predestination and Calvinism. It's about showing you why God did things the way he did them. That's why I went over the last part of Romans 11 to show you that. It's the reason he says that in verse 11 
It's not that God predestinated or forced Jacob to believe and he predestinated or forced Esau to be an unbeliever. It's that God knows the future is what it is. Look over in 1 Peter 1 and this is... We'll look at 1 Peter 1 and we'll look at Acts chapter 2 to just to answer the Calvinism argument. Um, to me, these are the two best passages here to show you. Um, here, let's see. First Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one and verse two. So the Calvinists like to talk about election, that God elected that Jacob would be saved and elected that Esau would go to hell. Well, it says here in First Peter 1 2, you get the definition of God's election. First Peter 1 2 says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So election is according to God's foreknowledge. So yes, before they were even born, before they did either good or evil, um, God's purpose according to election stood, and the purpose of God according to election stands according to God's call. So God elects before he's even born that Jacob is going to be the one who gets the promises and Esau is not. But we learn from 1 Peter 1, 2 that election is based upon God's foreknowledge. Not that he forced Jacob to believe or forced Esau not to believe. It's based on God's foreknowledge. He looks ahead in time. And, and you can see that that's what happens. You can see that Jacob believes God, Esau doesn't. And God sees that. I could see it reading it historically. But God can see it looking into the future. So then he says... It's not going to be like the flesh says where the firstborn gets the blessing. The secondborn, Jacob's going to get the blessing because I could see in the future that Jacob is going to believe me and Esau isn't. Therefore, Jacob is elect according to my foreknowledge. Uh, and then the other passage I asked you to get Acts 2. Because what these two passages show you, elect according to foreknowledge, the election shows God's sovereignty. But the foreknowledge shows man's free will. So when people say, well, which is it? Are you a Calvinist or God's completely sovereign? Or are you an Arminianist? It says God is basically on the free will. I'd say, I'm neither one. I'm a Bible believer. And the Bible tells me that God has a sovereign plan, but that sovereign plan is based upon God's foreknowledge of man's free will decisions. So another example where you can see both of them together is Acts chapter 2. We mentioned that God had the plan all along that he would have Jesus come and cru be crucified for our sins on a cross. But he didn't reveal that. And so that was God's plan. But yet here's Satan on his own saying, I know how I'll defeat God's plan. I'll have Jesus crucified on the cross. So Satan uses his free will to come up with the way he's going to attack God by having trying to get Jesus crucified. And God, knowing that that's what he would do, sets things up in a certain way to, to have his sovereignty of his plan of God being crucified on a cross realized. And you see that there in Acts 2.23. Acts 2.23 tells you Jesus, it says him, Jesus of Nazareth, being delivered by the determinate counsel. So determinate counsel. That, that counsel, C-O-U-N-S-E-L, that counsel was the counsel that God had according to Proverbs 8 with wisdom. And that would be, of course, all members of the Godhead. There is only one God, but there are three members of the one Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. For the, so the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and wisdom had a council and determined through that council that Jesus would be crucified. So that right there is God's sovereignty. So how was Jesus of Nazareth crucified? He was delivered by the determinate council and foreknowledge of God. So again, foreknowledge 
has to do with man's free will. And you can see there, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So they, God had the foreknowledge that they would be wicked people who would try to get rid of their Messiah by having him crucified. So then God comes up with a plan to save the world by having Jesus crucified. So you can see both going into, both factored in. So when you're in Romans 9 and verse uh, 11, Romans 9, 11, where it says, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto, the old, unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. God loves Jacob because Jacob in his, I'm sorry, God in his sovereignty knows Jacob's future free will decision before he's even born. He knows of Jacob's future free will decision to believe God. And he knows, so then he loves Jacob. And then he knows of Esau's future free will decision to reject God, to not believe him. Therefore, he hates Esau. Um, and, and you see also the reason, but the, and so that takes care of the Calvinistic argument. But the reason that Paul is bringing this up is because remember the flesh's objection is that God is not um, faithful. That God, uh, why should I apply Romans 1 through 8 doctrine or Romans 6 through 8 doctrine? Why should I walk in the Spirit? Why should I recognize who I am in Christ and let Christ live in me if God isn't going to fulfill His promises? And so what, what Paul is setting up is God has this supernatural foreknowledge of man's free will decisions. And He's in His sovereignty made a plan to which He can reconcile heaven back to Himself through the Gentiles and the earth back to himself through the Jews. And so you can trust that God will give you the promises that he's given, that he's uh, promised, because he's always been faithful. And the reason Israel doesn't have their promises yet is because they didn't believe. Esau didn't get the promise of God because he didn't believe. Ishmael didn't get the promise of God because he believed. Isaac gets it. Um, Jacob gets it because they're believers. And so what he's telling you there in verse 11, with that parenthetical phrase, rather than, than, than that being a support of Calvinism, because people just pull these verses out of here to support their doctrinal position. That's why I say I want to go through these verses here, because that's the danger of not understanding right division and not understanding all these three chapters, as people just pull out verses to support their false doctrinal position. And that's what the Calvinist does here. In the context of going against the flesh's argument that God is not faithful to His promises, what verse 11 is telling you is that the purpose of God according to election is going to stand. And it's not based upon you doing good or evil. The reason that God told Rebekah before Jacob and Esau is going to be born, the elder shall serve the younger is that that way they will know that God has foreknowledge and God's plan will be fulfilled. And so it's the purpose of God according to election based upon his foreknowledge of man's free will decisions. It's not based upon, in other words, it says not of works. Just like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, if, if God doesn't tell Rebecca before they're born that the elder shall serve the younger, then you can make the argument and say, well, Jacob was a better boy than Esau. Esau despised his birthright. Uh, Jacob um, you know, loved his mother, did what his mother wanted him to do. Uh, when he goes to uh, Laban's house, he loves Rachel and wants to marry her, and he promises to work seven years 
but yet he ends up working almost 21 years before he actually comes away with Rachel and, as his wife and they're free. And, uh, and he's got to have Leo with him. I mean, you know, that's got to be a, a hard thing if you, you, you know, here you, you, love, you love a woman and you want to marry her and you work seven years for it and now you end up and you're tricked and you're actually married to her sister? And then and now you're going to be married to two sisters? I mean, isn't that kind of a weird situation? And to do it, and instead of working seven years, you end up working about 20 years before you can get out of there. And now you're not only out of there with Rachel, you've also got Leah too. Uh, and then you've got Rachel and Leah fighting over you because one wants to have, because Rachel, you love Rachel, but you don't love Leah as much. But Leah's having all the kids and Rachel's not having the kids. So there's this constant fighting between these two sisters and you're having to put up with all this. I mean, you know, Jacob comes out as a, you know, a pretty good guy that he's willing to go through all of this, you know. Whereas Esau just rejects it right away. So you can look at the works of Jacob and say, well, of course Jacob gets uh, the, the promises, of course, because of his good works that he did, that he endured all of this. And of course Esau doesn't get it because he despised his birthright and he didn't do that good. So God puts that argument to rest. He says, no, he says, I've got your elect. Remember it says there in verse 11, the purpose of God according to election might stand. Your elect, according to my foreknowledge, of man's free will decisions, not of works, but of him that calleth. And you're called based upon you being born of the Spirit. Based on you believe in the gospel. It's based upon not of works, just like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You can cross-reference Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 with this. You're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Why did Jacob get the promise and not Esau? It's not of works, but of him that calleth, and God calleth him because he was elected, and he was elected because of God's foreknowledge that Jacob would believe God and Esau wouldn't. So the purpose of showing this is your flesh is saying, well, God's not faithful to the promises to Israel, so why should I apply Romans 6 through 8 doctrine? Why should I die daily to the flesh? Why should I suffer persecution when I'm not going to get the promises? And the point of this is, no, first off, it's based upon believing. Jacob gets the promises because he's a believer. Isaac gets the promises because he's a believer. Ishmael doesn't because he's an unbeliever. Esau doesn't because he's an unbeliever. And you can even see that by the fact that God tells you who's going to get the, uh, who's going to be the elect before they're even born because it shows you God's foreknowledge of their future free will decision to either believe God or not. And it's not based upon any works that they did because then they would boast. This is based upon election. So if God, based upon foreknowledge, so if God can understand all of that back in Israel, and he can remember going back to Romans 9, 6, they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Basically what God does from the very beginning and what Paul is establishing here is that while all the promises are to Israel in the flesh, it's only those who believe God that receive the promises. And that starts right from the start. He gives it to Abraham because he believes God. Isaac gets the promise. The, the next generation is Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac gets it because he believes God. The next generation is Jacob and Esau. Jacob gets the promises because he believes God. So what he's doing is he's saying there are not all Israel, spiritual Israel, getting the promises, which are of Israel, of the flesh. Let me demonstrate that, that from the beginning, there is spiritual Israel, Isaac, fleshly Israel, Ishmael, spiritual Israel, Jacob, fleshly Israel, Esau. And God, the purpose of God according to election still stood, even though there were some in Israel who didn't believe. So what does that do for us? And we'll get to the olive tree in Romans 11, who knows when, but uh, it will, he'll, he'll apply that to us. And the principle is, Everybody on the earth, because now God is no respecter of persons, whether you're Jew or Gentile. If you trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, God will give you eternal life. 
And if you read and believe Paul's epistles and apply that sound doctrine, you will get a reward in heavenly places. And the reason we know that is because God promised it and he's faithful to do it. Now you may be in a world, and we are in a world, where 99% of the people aren't believing that gospel. And out of those believers that are left, probably 99% of those people aren't rightly dividing the word of truth and getting sound doctrine out of Paul's epistles. But just because they're not doing it does not make the promises of God of none effect. Uh, Ishmael didn't believe God, but Isaac still received the promises. Esau didn't believe God, but Jacob still received the promises. So if you believe the gospel, you have eternal life in heaven, even though 99% of the people in this world don't have that. And then, of those believers, if you rightly divide the word of truth and get sound doctrine from Paul's epistles and apply that using the mind of Christ, you will get a reward in heaven, even though 99% of people who are going to heaven don't follow that. And I, mean, I don't know those percentages. I'm just making that up. So, in other words, you can... The flesh's argument that why should I apply that doctrine that I just learned in Romans 6 through 8 when I don't see God fulfilling the promises to Israel? Paul is saying, wait a minute, Romans 9, 6. Not as though the word of God had taken that effect. God was not unfaithful. God fulfills the promises to all Israel, spiritual Israel, not fleshly Israel. And I'm going to demonstrate that right from the beginning with Isaac and Ishmael and Jacob and Esau. And in fact, you even see with Jacob and Esau that God calls it right from the beginning. Because it's not of works, but it's of him that calleth. And he calls based upon election, based upon his foreknowledge of your free will decision of if you're going to believe God or not. So God knows that he's able to give the promises of eternal life in God's kingdom on earth and the rewards in, those in, that, in that kingdom, they will go to Isaac. They will go to Jacob. You don't see it yet because all of Israel isn't saved yet. So it's the same thing for us. The vast majority of this world is not going to believe the gospel. And of the believers that are left, the minority, the vast majority of them are not going to rightly divide the word of truth. They're not going to get sound doctrine from Paul's epistles, and they're not going to use the mind of Christ. But the purpose of God, according to election, still stands. Because remember what we read in Romans 8 about us. He said in Romans 8 and verse 29, Romans 8, 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also be, did predestinate, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things, if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. So he's, he's saying that no one can separate you from the love of God. No one can separate you from eternal life in heaven to be justified, to get a position in heavenly places, to be glorified. No one can separate you from those stuff. And just because you don't see Israel getting those promises, don't think God won't be faithful to you, as demonstrated by the fact that that the Israel of God, spiritual Israel, Isaac, Jacob, and you could go down the line to Joseph and Moses and you know, um, Joshua, Caleb, and some of the judges, and you know, on down the line there, you can see that there is a believing remnant of Israel throughout the history, and they get those promises, but they're not actually seen yet because all of Israel isn't saved yet. So we can take courage and, and rest in the fact that uh, God is faithful to our promises. I mean, if God is able, according to the purpose of God, according to election, if he's able to call out before Jacob and Esau are even born, and he says, the elder shall serve the younger, and we find out from history that that happened, then God can call to you, because remember, he's, a, he's called you, Romans 8, 28, 
He has elected you, Romans 8, 33. He's, verse 29, Romans 8, 29, has foreknown you, he's predestinated you. Uh, verse 30, he's called you, he's justified you, he's glorified you. Uh, he's all, the purpose of God according to election is going, stood with Jacob and Esau, therefore the purpose of God according to election will stand for you as a member of the body of Christ. You believe the gospel, you get the sound doctrine of the inner man. And just because there are a whole bunch of Ishmaels out there or a whole bunch of Esau's out there, don't let that detract you to say, oh, well, God's not going to fulfill the promises to me because God was faithful to the believing remnant of Israel as demonstrated by Isaac and Jacob. And God is going to be faithful to us even though the vast majority of the world rejects the gospel, rejects right division, rejects sound doctrine. That's the point of this. But you see, Calvinists take these verses out of context and now they start arguing free will and sovereignty and then you don't see the whole point. You don't see the flow of this. Um, so that's why it's important for us to understand. And we can trust in God and don't let our flesh deceive us because the whole reason the Calvinists do this is just a diversion tactic of Satan to get you off into some theological debate so you don't recognize what God is doing here. He's explaining why dispensationalism is true, why right division is true, why you can trust Romans 6 through 8 doctrine and apply it to your life. But if you're busy taking these verses out of context and debating with these Calvinists over sovereignty and free will, you miss the whole thing. So um, that's why it's important for us to understand the big picture, but also understand exactly what's going on in these verses so we'll know what to say. Because your flesh, your flesh does not want to apply Romans 6 through 8 doctrine. You know, he says over in Galatians 5. And verse 16, Galatians 5, 16, to walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But then verse 17, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So once you learn Romans 6 through 8 doctrine, your flesh lusts against the Spirit of Christ working in you to work that doctrine out through you, as you present your body a living sacrifice, and it fights you every step of the way. So it's going to fight you when, and try not to believe dispensationalism, not believe right division, and that's why you'll have theological debates that are taken out of Romans 9 through 11, where they take verses out of context, and it's not really what we're even talking about here. But if we can take those verses out of context, then you won't understand what Paul is doing here and you won't believe right division and dispensationalism. You won't allow Romans 6 through 8 doctrine to work in you and your flesh wins. So don't let Galatians 5, 17 happen to you, but read and believe what the word says and not just take out verses, but actually believe what it says. So we're out of time. We'll, stop ne we'll start next time um, with the God's mercy to Israel in Romans 9, 15, but then he shows his wrath on Pharaoh. Why does he do that? So we'll, we'll see that next time. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love toward us, that you, you commended it toward us by sending your son Jesus Christ to die on a cross for our sins. Help us, Lord, to not let our flesh win these arguments where it tries to deceive us in every direction, but help us, Lord, to just believe your word and uh, use the mind of Christ and apply it so that we bring glory to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.